All right, welcome to the FitFile podcast, where you're going to hear about anything and everything sports tech related, whether that's sports watches, bike computers, bike trainers, train wraps, and basically anything that you can use to level up your health, fitness, and sports game. So Des of Des Fit on YouTube, as well as myself, Ray of DCRainmaker.com, both a site as well as YouTube, we cover all sorts of sports technology goodness, whether it be action cameras or drones or uh, cycling trainers or bike computers, watches, you name it, anything that's going to kind of touch on endurance sports or just sports in general from a sports technology standpoint, we're there to talk about it. All right, so on this episode, we've kind of got a grab bag of different things we're going to talk about. So Super Sapiens is going under. They're a CGM company that's aimed for the endurance sports market. Uh, we have more SPD power meter pedals. We're going to talk about skiing apps on different kinds of watches and how they act. Google is also releasing some new updates for their original Pixel watch and some other random topics we're going to talk about as well. So I guess, first of all, should we just start it out like last week's episode where we're just going to power meter pedals, straight thing? Power meter pedals, let's, let's just do it. All right, cool. So yeah, so Look has some new power meter pedals both on the road side as well as the SPD side. So go ahead and get us started with these. Yeah, so Look Look has actually been in the power meter pedal business for a long time. In fact, arguably as long as anyone else out there. Um, I think it was 2011 they announced the first power meter pedal in conjunction with Polar, uh, the, the watch company, um, to make Polar's second power meter. By the way, like fun seeker fact there. Huh. Uh, Polar made a chain based power meter like two decades ago. Um, yeah. Huh. Crazy, huh? Really? Things you never knew about. Yeah, a chain-based power meter like two decades ago, and they went back in it again in 2011 in conjunction with Look. And uh, at the time, they had like a really funky install process, and you could get it accurate. It was an accurate power meter once you got through that install process, but it was not awesome to get through that install process. And it really um, lost the main appeal of a pedal-based power meter, which was the idea that you can quickly move it between bikes because this whole process was a mess. Um, so they did that with Polar for a while, and then eventually... Look started branding it and doing it on their own using the exact same system just without the, the Polar logos on the side. Uh, and then fast forward a number of years until 2018-ish or so, maybe 2019, somewhere in there, um, they partnered with SRM to basically take that exact same system and put an SRM branding on it as well. And I think there was some some more stuff behind the scenes, but at the end of the day, it was, you know, Look Pedals um, and a Look uh, Power Meter system, but with SRM branding on it. Uh, hmm. That was the SRM Exact Pedals, but still the same, like, it wasn't quite as bad as it used to be, but it was a very, like, cumbersome process. Sure. Um, then from there, SRM did their own thing for the mountain bike pedal, uh, this one here, uh, the SRM X Power pedal, and, you know, that, that did not have anything Look inside of it, and at least uh, until recently anyways, and so that was, like, their own thing. Look then, in the meantime, went off and decided to make their own power meter pedals, um, which is two different power meter pedals. There is both a mountain bike version as well as the road version, which I forgot to grab that's sitting over there. But um, point is, there are two pedals, a Look uh, Kio version for the road and then an SPD uh, for the mountain bike side. And these are totally developed within Look themselves, and they get rid of that entire funky install process. So the install process for these is just as easy as any other pedal you just put it on and be done with it now these are kind of similar to something like the garmin rally pedals right where you can actually yep. interchange the bodies on these correct so that's that's like their big i wouldn't say it's a thing they're leaning in on but it's definitely a big piece of it uh, so in the case of the garmin rallies you have basically three different pedal body options you've got the spd for off-road usage primarily uh you got the Lokio side and then you have the shimano spdsl for road side and you can mix and match where you just basically take the spindle out and you have a different pedal body uh, look is doing the exact same thing where you've got the spindle inside you can swap a spindle back and forth between uh the road side and the mountain bike side and, and you're basically paying for the pedal body so you pay roughly about 250 300 bucks if you wanted a different pedal body set i've been always kind of curious about the feasibility or how many people actually go through that process in terms of different seasons and whatnot i mean it, it's not like it's a hard process but i feel like at least with the garmin rallies it's just cumbersome enough where i wouldn't really want yeah. to do the pro want to do that I think, you know, it was funny. I was talking to uh, our friend uh, Shane Miller, GP Llama, over the last couple of days about this. And uh, we both, it's one of those things that it's really tough because it's an incredible selling point, right? There's this fantasy that you're going to do this somewhat frequently, that you're going to buy this one set of pedals and like seasonally-ish. You're like, oh, I'm going to go into mountain biking now for the fall or whatever the case is, right? And you're going to move it back and forth. And you might do that once maybe twice and then you're like no i'm buying i'm good man i'm gonna buy another yeah. set of pedals of that yeah 
Right. Yeah. But it's it's something that is a huge selling point, though, for companies. It's a massive selling point um, to have that ability and market that ability, even if, practically speaking, very few people do it more than once or twice. Mm-hmm. Right? It's sort of like cycling dynamics, right? You look at it like once or twice and you're like, that, that's that's. I what mean, I, I, I look at uh, my power pedal phase factor on every single ride. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> PCO2? <laughs> Man. Um, no, it's it's one of those things that's really tough. Um, I think it's not, it's not a tough thing to do. It's one of those things that's a tough thing to do right that we're talking about uh, changing pedal bodies. Right, right. It's a tough yeah. thing to do right um, fast and to do right fast numerous times in a row yeah right? and mm-hmm. so the thing and i talked to garmin about this years ago is that you know you have to be uh, you do not want to rush swapping pedal body uh, spindles between pedal bodies because if you do you're going to break something it's as simple as that yeah you get, um, get a there, small piece of dirt in there or something like that yeah it's not ideal yeah yeah, this isn't like just, you know, swapping a pedal off a bike. You need to go ahead and take the parts off, the rubber seals, there's O-rings involved, or all things has to be cleaned. You want to do it somewhere that you're not going to lose little parts. It's, again, so anyways, Look does the same thing there uh, with very similar pricing in terms of the pedal bodies uh, to swap back and forth as Garmin's. Uh, but their overall pricing is slightly below Garmin's. Um, so, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, their overall pricing for the pedals is uh, basically 1000 bucks, 999 It's either euros or dollars, doesn't matter, for the roadside, mm-hmm. and 1100 bucks for or the mountain bike side. Yeah, like we're going to talk about comparative pricing in just one second, yep. but it is kind of interesting to see that now we're seeing a lot of actual SPD power meter pedal options come to the market. And um, I believe that's because the SPD patent has run out on both correct. what SPD as well as SPD SL, correct? Yep, SPD ran out first, um, I think about two years ago. Whatever the time was that the SRM pedal came out, uh-huh. this basically came out like, to the day that the patent ran out, sure. right? Like that's the, they basically, they, they waited until the patent, obviously everyone knows these patents are gonna run out. This isn't like surprise, right? right? You know, the exact day it comes out. And so uh, that that released pretty much like the day after sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, and then the SPD SL side, um, the patent also ran out, I think like a year, year and a half ago, give or take. Um, so that's why we're seeing more companies go into that realm. Uh, and, you know, look in their case, they still have the Kio as the road pedal. And I actually asked them, I said, hey, you know what? Do you see an appetite for also doing an SPDSL pedal body as well? Like, is that something you might do on the roadside, uh, given there's obviously huge demand for, you know, that that pedal type? And they said they had a lot of discussion internally about it in, inside of Look. Um, and it wasn't like a hard no, but they were concerned that from a company standpoint, um, if they were to release an SPDSL pedal, that sort of like eats away at the core of their identity being Look. <laughs> As yeah, their brand, exactly. Right? That's like um, it's a look cleat. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> or, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Be kind of like Boeing selling Airbus planes or vice versa, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, and I think you know, in the case of uh, the SPD side of it, you know, that's that's a little bit different. I think in how uh, how that market uptake has happened. Right. And, uh, for the road side, there is obviously a huge demand for both of those pedal body standards between uh, not standards is a weird term, but pedal body uh, platforms, right? Between sure. Look and uh, SPDSL versus on the mountain bike side. So there's a, a pretty heft towards a uh, pretty big heft towards SPD. Yeah. And I think what's great uh, too, is that, you know, we are seeing uh, like four very solid options from companies other than the Shimano, because I'm not sure if we want to see a Shimano, you know, make a power meter pedal, but anyways, <laughs> looping. <laughs> wah, wah. Yeah, oh, exactly. So looping back to the actual options. So, so we I feel have- like we need to have a scoreboard like somewhere in the back here that every time Shimano gets made fun of for the power meter oh, accuracy, like it just we, needs to be like a, a checkbox per episode. Right? Yeah. So like, we're not, yeah, we're not that fancy on the podcast yet where we have the little buttons that do the wah, wah, wah. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll, yeah get there. Exactly. we'll get there, folks. We will get there. So, uh, but yeah, in terms of the four options now, so we have Vivero, Look, Garmin, and SRM, and I kind of listed them down in terms of price there. So, Fibero, we have at a astoundingly low $750. And I'm going to be talking about the dual versus single-sided options here. So Fibero has a $750 for the dual-sided, $500 for their single. Look, $1,100 for the dual, and then $759 for the single. And I'm specifically talking about the SPD versions, by the way. The Look cleat versions are $100 less. Garmin has their Rally XEs at $1,200 and $700. And then SRM, a whopping $1,500 and $1,200 for uh, their variant. So 
Comparing all those options there, so, you know, look is similar to Garmin pricing there, but, you know, really look, Garmin and SRM, they're so much higher than Favero at this point. So why would someone want to buy this look variant over, let's say, the Favero? Yeah, I think, um, so from a battery standpoint, starting there first, uh, both the Look and the Favero are, are identical at 60 claimed hours. Um, and, you know, real life battery life seems to be trending in that same direction as well. Versus Garmin is is more at 120 to 150 because they, different, they use coin cell versus rechargeable. Um, but that's a whole different topic for a different day. Look, oh, sorry, then and, and the SRM side, they're at like 40 to 50-ish claimed hours, but with a massive asterisk there that they burn between like, three to eight percent per day uh in standby oh so like if you have a week if you have a week where you don't use this pedal it'll just basically be like halfway dead oh. right assuming you charged it okay it's it's not good um so then you get to why would you spend you know uh, why would you spend more on look versus favero or garment versus uh favero um and I think pedal body swapping is, you know, the, the fantasy aside, that is a very real reason to potentially do that. Um, the other real reason uh, is potentially if you're doing a lot of jumps. So in the case of the Favero pedal, it is limited to a category three, um, which means it drops of no more than 24 inches or 61 centimeters uh, on that pedal. Uh, and that's from a structural electronic standpoint. So they're, they're not, does not sound like they're concerned about the structural integrity of the pedal like breaking on you but from the electronic spindle inside uh potentially not doing that and, and talking to look sorry talking to favero um they have tested up to cat three and so that's what they've that's what they're going to claim uh you know said maybe down the road they'll increase their claim if they test beyond that to the next spec level um and in looks case they don't have a limit there and that's something that they're pretty proud of when you talk to them that you know they, this is focused on their pro um my teams are going to use this to have drops much bigger than 24 inches, which is not very much, of course. Um, that's a, a fairly small drop. I, it's interesting to me, the look pedals, the one selling factor for me is actually the, well, look of it. Um, it's it's an yeah. absolutely gorgeous pedal. I mean, I think that of the uh, pedals that you have in front of you there, I, I don't know, like personally, I'm not a gigantic fan of how the SRM looks. I, I think it's it's yeah. very utilitarian. But yep. you know, on the complete opposite end of the scale, though, you have that look pedal, and it's it's absolutely gorgeous. And I think the actual road pedal looks fantastic as well. Yeah, no, it they both look great. And the road pedal, so that is one reason on the road side of things. Uh, speaking of the road pedal, is that it is the lightest power meter pedal by far. Like it's not even close. I think it's what 131 or 135 grams yeah. uh, per pedal. It's a carbon-based uh, road pedal. The, their nearest competitors are basically the 150 to 160 range per pedal. So I mean, dramatically lower. Uh, technically, the Wahoo yeah. Speedplay pedal itself is lighter, but that's a a useless technicality because yeah. uh, with Speedplay cleat design, you have to have all all the mounting stuff on that is essentially transferred to your shoe. So once you include that, you're like way, way beyond everything else. So um, practically speaking, um, and even again, no matter how you want to define it, Looks Road pedal is the lightest power meter pedal in the market, period. Um, and then the by far asterisk depends on how you want to include the Wahoo stuff. But once you include the reality of how the Wahoo mounts, then it's not even the same ball yeah. anymore. So uh, at this point, you have put out your look, uh, first look. Uh, I keep on using that word. Oh, Sorry. Yeah. I missed it. You're right. I, I think I titled it hands on, but I should have done first look. First look. look. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> so at this point, oh. so you've, you've done your first look hands on impression. So uh, walk us through why it wasn't a full review and when that's the, your full review is going to be coming. So I was just riding along. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> I was just <laughs> riding along. Always. <laughs> yeah, as always. And so I've had I've had the pedal for a few months now. Both myself and my wife have been putting it through its paces, different iterations. We've had kind of pre-production stuff, and then we've had production stuff the last few weeks. Um, and uh, a couple of different things popped up. Um, in the case of what my wife and I were doing was like dividing and conquering. And she was um, running with the road pedals, and I was running with the SPD, um, uh, you know, off-road pedals, using both on-road and off-road. 
And, you know, she had an issue first uh, kind of pretty quickly on the, the road side where basically she got a random zero offset. And zero offset's a calibration of a power meter pedal. And so you're essentially calibrating two pedals in reality because you have two sides. Uh, and something went wrong where um, behind the scenes it told her that it was calibrated. In reality, one side was not actually calibrated. Um, and so it had these wrong values. And so she was seeing weird offsets and stuff like that. And look looked into that um and they found it was a firmware bug and they've already addressed that in a firmware update so that's good box checked but certainly a, a bit of a concern right this close to production uh this close to just shipping but the the real issue came when i i was on my on the road bike side with the spd pedal so with the mountain bike pedal did some baselining there all was good did some trainer ride stuff all was good switched over the mountain bike uh initial testing on the trainer all was good and then I went for a mountain bike ride. This is on the final production set. Again, I've been using other ones. Otherwise, went out for a mountain bike ride uh, and it had rained a lot recently. And I went through a really big puddle slash small pond thing. Um, pond, yeah, I mean, it wasn't quite lake status. <laughs> we're not talking was... ocean, right? Or because no, we, no, we... not yet. That, that would come later. No, oh, we're talking yet. ponds okay. here. <laughs> no, this is this is this is clean pond water but it's definitely this this thing was now a pond the, the bike path became a pond you could have taken a small boat across this um i chose to take a bike um and so i, I pedaled across it it was above <laughs> the bottom bracket uh i'm sure des will overlay some some b-roll for those watching on <laughs> youtube which is by the way the best way to watch this uh to listen to this if you if you can and so in doing that um after i got to the end of the pond and this was like a 20 or 30 second journey uh the power cut out but it also cut out for the quirk that was on the mountain bike as well uh and i troubleshot a little bit and it was like oh okay this i think this may be a connectivity issue given the the edge units connecting to these was like oh, i can't connect anymore what do i do um and uh, i kept on retrying on the quark and finally it connected back in again like a, a minute or two later but on the look side it took like eight to ten minutes to get it connect and i'm still putting that tentatively maybe in the camp of a garmin problem based on some other stuff that was going on but not really sure. Either way, that was slightly concerning. What was more concerning is when it did connect, it was offset by like 20 plus watts. Like it was mm. it was immediately displeased. And I tried to do zero offsets and calibrations and all the stuff out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and it wasn't really fixing it. But nonetheless, I'm like, eh, whatever. I'm just going to keep on riding. So at this point in my ride, I transited the pond because i was trying to get to the beach and in the netherlands and in belgium riding along the beach is like a thing people do it's like a there's like races out there with pro level races where you just you blast along the beach as close to the ocean as you can but you're kind of like going in and out of the water slightly where the sand is hard packed down yeah. there uh, if you try to do a pie it's just soft you won't go anywhere like you're just you're stuck so i do that it's a, a normal thing to do it's again a, a very vibrant pro scene of doing that and there's obviously salt water getting in the bike around on the bike and stuff like that because you're crossing you know tidal pools that are draining back into the ocean and again here's some more b-roll for those that are watching um, to see what that looks like and again it's still offset this entire time and i couldn't really seem to fix that but just ignored it for an hour and a half or so out on the beach and i started heading back in again had to go back across the pond and that time it actually cleared the pond no problems it stayed connected everything was good so the next day i'm ready to go back out again and do another ride mountain bike and I start riding and the numbers are just crazy pants. They're like 4,000 watts and 2,000 watts and 3,000 watts. And as you know, Des, I'm an amazing cyclist, um, like top tier cyclist. Yeah. <laughs> but I can only do like, you know, 2,800 to 3,000 watts on the daily, not not quite the, the 4,000. Yeah, I mean, um, that's your five minute power average. So that's great, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I wasn't, you know, I I was suspecting things were wrong there, uh, and then like I'd be easy pedaling at a thousand watts. I'd literally be just like moving at two miles an hour across the pavement of parking lot. I mean, at, like a thousand watts. You guys should see his quads. I mean, yeah, and then you'd believe it. Beastly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So on top of that, the pedal was showing things like ninety percent balance on one side. Like it was, it was definitely displeased with life. Um, so. I kind of ring up a uh, look and I'm like, hey, I've I've got some, there's something going on here. I'm not sure what's going on at this point, but uh, things are definitely displeased. Uh, we run through a bunch of tests and they, uh, to say they were concerned would be the understatement of the year. They were very, very concerned. So concerned, in fact, that they put their lead engineer and their lead product manager uh, in a car to drive basically overnight from their headquarters in France up to Amsterdam on the weekend, um, arriving here on Sunday morning to dive into what's going on and they deconstructed the entire pedal sets on this very table right here 
taking them apart, looking into them, figuring out what's going on with them, uh, running a whole bunch of analysis, both on the bike before they did that, as well as taking it apart. And, uh, you know, they did a bunch of initial work here at the DCR cave, and then they took it back to their headquarters to like really take it apart in like a clean room type environment. And what they found when they were here kind of was reconfirmed by what they found when they got back um, home, which was that there was a manufacturing defect in the of the pedal spindle itself. Actually, there was two manufacturing defects, but there was one that there was a basically a ribbon cable, if you will, that was um, not in the right place inside that attaches to the strain gauges. Um, and then that combined with a secondary defect on one of the housing, let essentially that seawater get into a spot that it should never have gotten into. Um, and so the seawater actually itself, the water is able to get into the pedal body. That's not really a problem or a concern, but there is then a second protection layer inside the spindle or on the outside of the spindle technically um, that keeps the seawater from getting to the strain gauge into this misplaced ribbon cable. Um, so it's sort of one of those like Swiss cheese effects where, um, you know, if one failure had happened, actually things would have been fine, but two failures happening is what took out the pedal. Um, now, obviously, they're they're deeply concerned about that, um, mostly probably because it was me that it happened to, um, but also because uh, the the likelihood that that only happened to me is a that's you know on all the pedal sets they've made, what's the chance of that happening? Um, and they did check the other pedals I had, and they didn't have that defect, but um, they're they're going back and trying to figure out what the heck happened. Like, they know that did not meet their quality, you know, internal standards, but mm -hmm. to figure out the scale of that, et cetera. So um, anyways, basically, that's kind of the long story of why I didn't do a full review, because at this point, I need to wait for a final, final product to show yeah. up that I can validate and go out and ride the crap out of some oversized puddles and, you know, seawater and put it through its paces. Um, I will say to looks credit. I mean, obviously, you know, you don't want that to happen to, to anyone, but they certainly don't want it to happen to me and they don't want it to happen for their pedals. Um, but crap happens. Like, yeah. as I pointed out in my Favero MX review, right, I had a, a set of these set was sent, like a pre-production set um, that was should have been, like, pretty solid that was missing the screws on the, the pedal body, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, yeah. literally missing the screws, right? And they were deeply embarrassed about that as well. Um, and I declared it in my review because I wanted to say, hey, I believe this is solved, right? But I I can't guarantee it. I mean, they, yeah. uh, I, I am 100% certain it's solved um, now for Pharaoh's case. Um, but, you know, things happen. Um, and that's what the point is with, look, they have owned that problem start to finish. Like they, you know, there was no point to that entire process where they tried to blame me for anything. They said, yep, riding through that puddle. And they saw, I had video of the puddle. I had to have video of the the ocean riding, I had video of the cleaning the bike afterwards with a hose, and like all of those things are well below the threshold they test against um, uh, in terms of water pressures, in terms of they test seawater. That's literally one of their tests is seawater immersion because they know people ride on the beaches. That's a European thing to do. Um, and so uh, at no point have they said, this is my fault for doing something I shouldn't do. Um, they have owned it end to end as like, we've done effed up, we need to do better. All right, cool. So that's uh, the new Look SPD power meter pedal. So we look forward to your final, final in-depth review of that coming soonish, hopefully. So the the not first look look. Right? Yeah, the, yeah, exactly. No, the in-depth <laughs> look. Yeah. So uh, so next there up, let's go. yeah yeah. Uh, so next up, let's. <laughs> Yeah. So next up, let's talk about really briefly some skiing apps. So you were just recently in France, right? And uh, like the yep. Chamonix area doing some skiing and you tested or you did a comparison between the Apple Watch Slopes app and Garmin's native skiing functionality on their watches. So I've actually done individual reviews of both of these apps over the years, but you kind of did a comparison between the two. So tell us about what you liked about each one and what you think may be better on each one. Yeah, so I was skiing uh, in the Mont Blanc Chamonix area, so that it's kind of got a whole valley of ski resorts um, there. And uh, I had for many, many years been intending to do a like Garmin ski video of sorts, like you know how skiing works, similar to what you did, you know, last year or whatever it was. Um, and every year I like filmed it, but never actually like 
cohesively had a storyline. I just filmed a lot of B-roll, basically, right? And I uh, uh, never got around to doing it. So this time I set it like a timeline. I'm like, 48 hours after I get back, this needs to be done and published, hell or high water. But I decided this time to do a comparison between the Garmin side and the Apple Watch side. And of course, the challenge there is that Apple technically has a ski profile um, on the watch, but it's no, useless. It's it just like a... Records your heart rate. Right? Yeah. That's all it does. Yeah, it's, it's a categorization thing. It is it not is. a... It does not count your ski runs, et cetera, versus what Garmin does, counts your ski runs, counts your laps, your max speeds, like all the stats that you want to brag about at a ski or in the lodge, it's doing all that for you, your vertical for the day, et cetera. So on the Apple Watch side, a really famous app that people use is Slopes. And Slopes is a totally free app. Uh, and frankly, almost everything you need in that app is on the free version. But you can also pay 29 bucks a year for what it seems to be like a single developer, like a single dude doing this. Yeah, based I on think what it's I like gather. right down the road for me. He lives in Boulder, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm happy to support the little guy and pay 30 bucks, because let's be honest, in the, in the price scheme of skiing, like... It's a very good app, folks. Like, I mean, very good app. Very cool. Like, yeah. it's, it's cool to see sometimes, like, these indie developers, that's, like, one person, right? I that know, makes right? these incredible apps that right. are so well done. Yeah, especially when they have graphical skills. I think that's the key, and he does, yeah, right? He's got, yeah. like, the... The skills to make this all just be like, boom, nailed it. So anyways, I get out there and I'm basically comparing these two watches actually. So Epix Pro um, versus Apple Watch Ultra 2. And the watches actually don't matter at all here, to be honest. It's, it's really the platform uh, in the sense that virtually every Garmin watch that has an altimeter minus the brand new Forerunner 165 has ski mode um, and every watch on the Apple Watch side will work as well just fine because it's using the Slopes app. Um, and so one of the things that you you start you know recording here uh, is that on the, the Garmin side, you have a ton of customization on the watch itself, what you see from a data page and data field standpoint. So uh, it is, you know, just like any other sport, if you're familiar with the Garmin watch, that you can customize your data, page, data pages, your data fields, and, you know, add more data pages, add more data fields. You can see uh, the maps on the Garmin watch for the ski resort, and you can actually see the, the runs and the lifts and things like that. Versus on the Apple Watch side with the Slopes app anyways, uh, you're essentially seeing your total stats for the day. And then you can attempt to use the digital crown to go ahead and see the per run stats. Uh, and I say attempt because you, you, you really can't. Because you got to um, use the crown and um, that's hard. It's really, really yeah, it's, hard very hard with gloves on right so you imagine in my case i was wearing it between my glove and my coat so i kept the watch on my wrist and i think in a second maybe des will talk about what happens when you don't keep it on your wrist uh, and keep it on it's outside the coat but in my case i had it in the little gap there which worked great i could see it no problems you know like you just go like this and it opens up the gap between your glove and your coat um but then if you were trying to use the digital crown you got this big old glove and you're like wiggle wiggle and it doesn't it just doesn't work. It's as simple as that. Um, on the Garmin side, of course, you got a lot of buttons, so it's really easy to use those buttons to iterate through uh, the data pages, even with big gloves, um, and you can do that. Uh, so from a per skiing, while I was skiing itself, it was fascinating how incredibly close the two metrics were. Like sometimes the total descent for the day would be within like four meters for the entire day. Like, yeah, we're talking which thousands. Which is mind-boggling. Yeah, thousands of meters, yeah. Right, yeah, you're talking, yeah, five, five, six thousand meters to be within four meters. You're like, damn. And top speeds were often within 0 0.1 kilometers an hour um, for two different watches on two different wrists. You're like, well done. However, that magic happens. Good job. Um, so then you get to post skiing stats, and that's where you see the biggest difference. So again, during skiing, I would say Garmin pretty easily wins in terms of like seeing those stats and customization and making it really easy to go like per run total stats back and forth. But post skiing we want to like be the data analysis geek and look at all your stats the slope app is so damn good it's, it's killer so so good um on the garmin side you're basically get the exact same like overall stats you get for a run it's going to show your runs like for outdoor like running running um it's going to show your runs though uh downhill runs and your max speed and the descent and that's kind of it yeah yeah yep. that's basically it mm -hmm. um versus the slopes app 
it's insane. Like the you're gonna get these crazy 3D diagrams. You're gonna see all your stats for just not just that day, but um, for the entire trip. You can create trips. So you can say this trip spanned this week uh, time frames at the ski area. Group all those stats together, so you can say, oh yeah, for this trip so far, I've had you know 50,000 feet of vertical or 100,000 feet of vertical. How does it compare to last year's trip? How does it compare to last year's season? You can get weather built. I mean, it's like the world is your oyster for so many cool features that you can either use the base side of it or you can like really dig in as deep as you want to. It's it's super impressive. I'm not sure if we we may have skipped over this, but the reason that you actually want one of these dedicated skiing apps is that it uses the altimeter to automatically track your actual ski runs versus your time on the chair lift. So it can just automatically track all these stats all day long versus the normal skiing app on an Apple Watch, which literally will just like record your heart rate all day long. So, you know, in terms of skiing, yeah. you want to know like how many runs you're taking, what's your max speed on a particular run, your max speed for a particular day, all that kind of stuff. And both the Slopes app as well as Garmin's native ski app does that. And I would also mention that Chorus and Sunto do have a similar ski functionality to a Garmin Watch as well. So uh, Polar, unfortunately, it's pretty much just like the Apple Watch native skiing app where it just kind of records your heart rate. So, but in terms of the uh, actual skiing experience versus the app race skiing experience, it, again, with the Garmin implementation, it's just a lot nicer just because you do have those physical buttons where you can actually use those with gloves to be able to iterate through those pages. With the digital crown on an Apple Watch, it's just really, really challenging, whether you have gloves or not. And this goes back to what Ray was just talking about there a second ago is that for me, when I'm skiing, I like to have the watch on the outside of my jacket so I don't have to, you know, roll down my glove or lift up my jacket to see all those stats. So even with that, uh, with the Apple Watch or the Garmin watch on top of my jacket, it's still pretty challenging to use that crown to iterate through all those stats. And what's kind of nice about the Garmin implementation, though, is that you actually can have an auto scroll feature too, where it can automatically scroll through all your data pages so you can see your current run stats, your total run stats, all that kind of stuff without ever having to even touch the buttons. And then one more thing with the Garmin app too is that you do have ski maps on the actual watch itself. Now, the ski maps are really cool. In terms of the actual usefulness of them, I, uh, I don't know what. What's this your... is like the pedal body. This is just it's the exact same conversation, just swapping pedal bodies. Right, right? exactly. I feel like it's, it's, yeah, it sounds amazing. In practical usage, it's just super cumbersome. Like yeah. I feel like the only time you are going to use those ski maps in real life is when you are upside down in a tree well somehow. Like basically, <laughs> and you're like. I don't know where I well, am right then, now. <laughs> I don't know where I am. We're going to figure this out together, right? Yeah, yeah. But like in every other scenario, whether it's on a gondola or a chairlift, they, a lot of them have the ski maps on the chairlift bars now. It's awesome, at least yeah. in this resort. So at the top of the lift, you're just going to use the big map there because it's so much better. Yeah. Um, and it's really slow, to, on the, especially on the ski maps, to scroll around, to render that, like just took forever. Yeah, um, yeah. So again, I, I appreciate like Garmin checking the box. Uh, but I'm I'm not going to use that unless things go really wrong. You know, and here's the thing. It's not even checking a box. They did, for the actual idea and implementation, it's a fantastic implementation. I mean, like, they literally have yep. the actual chairlift that you're on, the actual ski run that you're on. They even label the map with, like, blue, black, green runs. Yep. It's seriously, it's phenomenal implementation. Again, the usefulness of it, it's like, eh. However, then we talk about the Apre ski experience with the Slopes app, though, versus the Garmin app. And like Ray was saying, it, this is a night and day difference here where the Slopes app, they they can give you like, you know, on the actual map that they have there, you can actually show like, all right, this is the actual chairlift I went up. This is the actual run I went down. This is going to be yeah. my per day PRs. It's phenomenal. In all fairness, though, the Garmin app, it's still an app that's trying to do everything versus the Slopes app, which is a dedicated app. So, yeah. yeah. I'd like to see Garmin maybe for next season, North American season anyways, put a little more emphasis on the on the ski side of it. Like I'd like to see them have a focus that maybe they launch in November or October where it's like, hey, we've built in more functionality on the skiing side that caters to 
the skiing stats. Um, I think that'd be cool. One that's really cool in the slopes app too that um, I think I mentioned in my video is that the way I was skiing there was that basically the kids were in ski school in the morning and the adults had like free ski time. And then in the afternoon, we'd meet up with the kids and go skiing with them. So that meant that in the morning, we were often skiing at a different ski area in the grand scheme of the valley. And then we would, you know, take a bus or vehicle back to get back to the, where the kids were skiing at a, a smaller ski area um, that was more suited to them. But what's cool is that I would record both of those as separate activities. So basically on the, the slope side, I would, you know, start that in the morning and then end it just after lunch uh, at one area. And then, you know, 15 minutes of the valley, I would do again the same with the kids. And it would actually like combine those two as one cohesive day each day and show me my entire day, like just as one cohesive thing as opposed to like treating them as two different days or whatever the case. And you can, of course, mm. break these out if you wanted to and delete portions if you didn't like that or whatever, but just just super, super cool. Yeah. The final thing that's worthwhile noting, though, is that you can technically get the best of both worlds here because the Slopes app does connect to Garmin Connect. So you can use your Garmin watch and mm. actually connect uh, slopes with it, and it pulls in all your ski data. It pulls in years. I pulled in the last five years of my Garmin ski data into Slopes, and then, like, you get the best of everything, yep. best of on watch performance and best of uh, app race key stuff. Yeah. And I think that's a good point there that the slopes app, although we both did videos on the Apple watch implementation or usage of it, the slopes app, you can use it just on your actual phone too. You don't even need, yep. uh, you don't need a watch at all. So for the slopes app, again, really huge kudos to the developer of this app out there. Go support him. Awesome. Awesome app for, not just your Apple Watch, but your your iPhone, actually Android phone, or your Garmin. World is your oyster on that one. So yeah, yeah, yeah super cool. All right, so next up, let's talk about uh, going completely off the rails here. It's a completely different subject. Let's talk about Super Sapiens shutting down. So Super Sapiens, they created a continuous glucose monitor aimed for endurance athletes. Um, so I have never tested one of these devices, but you have done pretty extensive testing with this one. So what's, I guess, your experience with it? And let's, yeah, let's talk about this news. Yeah, so they came out a couple years ago. Um, I don't know, three, four years ago, maybe something like that. Uh, and the idea is that you have this tiny little puck about the size of like a quarter or a coin of some sort, a euro, whatever. Um, and it will basically be injected into your skin. There's a small needle in the bottom of it. They don't like to say needle, like they, they like to say filament, but it's it's a needle at the end of the day. It pokes you and it pokes in your skin and it measures your glucose levels in somewhat real time. And then that little pod that you put, you know, typically like on the underside of your, um, uh, of your arm will then stay there for 14 days to the second um, so at the end of 14 days that unit expires uh, and it's you throw it away of course continuous glucose monitors are not new to diabetics who have been doing this for for many many years the newish part here is using it from a sport or an endurance sport in particular uh, kind of monitoring standpoint and the idea behind it all is that you would monitor your glucose levels and you could see um, while you're doing primarily longer activities realistically two hours plus um, and usually at slightly higher intensities uh, you can see when a bonk might be upcoming. So in other words, when you're going to, you know, overrun uh, the amount of nutrition you have um, that you're you know, feeding your body with uh, and then try to manage that nutrition better um, in real time. And of course, outside of uh, training and racing, you could also try to manage, uh, you know, nutrition intake as well. Just, I mean, even if I drank a coffee, you would see this huge spike in my glucose levels about 10, 15 minutes later, um, or if you ate a bunch of sugary stuff or whatever the case is. And again, for a, a person without diabetes, for the most part, if you're eating healthy-ish, right, then it, it's all fine. But for a person with diabetes, they need to monitor this much more closely, hence why this has been used for a, a long time. So with that backstory there, I I tried this a few times over the last couple of years uh, and one point for like six months at a time and I had generally speaking what's supposed to happen is that while you're doing a workout you're supposed to it'll raise your the level that it's monitoring uh, basically from uh, up to like 140 to 170 ish or so is their goal as a value so they got kind of like a, a power number a heart rate number or whatever you want to call it um, it's a, a number that just moves along and then while you're sitting there like if I'm sitting here right now that value might sit around 100 give or take the problem was that when I would go do a workout my value would actually plummet it would go down to like 60 or 70 at best so i had the inverse reaction of 
all the data they had. Um, and, you know, I kind of say, hey, what do I do with this? I'm going out to work out and the number is plummeting. I'm supposed to be up here according to the app because it has these like bars and stuff where it keeps you in between. And I said, well, you're just one of the people that it does differently. And I'm like, OK, so what is that? What does that mean, right? Like that'd be sort of like saying if you went out, like imagine from a heart rate standpoint, that if you know you went and did an intense interval and your value instead of you know going up to 160, 170 for an intense interval, it'd be like 30, right? And you're like, <laughs> am I gonna die? What's what's going on? Um, and I said, yeah, we just don't have the data to. We don't. They basically at the end of the day, they didn't know what to do about that from like a science standpoint. They they said yes, it can happen to some people, but not everyone. So I was always in this pickle from review standpoint because. You know, if I review this, I am theoretically the outlier that like it doesn't work for me. So the technology is theoretically super cool. But at the end of the day, you know, they have all these pro athletes that they were highlighting and this and that. Um, and, you know, they would use it for long fueling, et cetera. But it just didn't work for my body. So I was kind of like in this pickle of this. Um, and, you know, the other challenge that you have is that um, the only way to get around that was I could take a bunch of nutrition in, a ton of nutrition, um, and that would spike my values to the 160 to 170. But now I'm essentially getting to a scenario where I'm overfueling everything just to raise the values as opposed to having it providing me useful data about what I'm doing during a workout. Um, and finally, the last challenge is that realistically speaking, this was only valuable for workouts over about 90 minutes, give or take, and really only steady state workouts with a moderate level of intensity. So you couldn't use it for interval workouts because it was too variable and that you wouldn't be able to like flesh out the data you needed to. So you combine all that with the price point, which was roughly about 160 to 200 euros a month. And when I say euros, because they only got um, authority to operate within Europe. So they did not get FDA approval on the US side. Uh, and what Super Sapiens was using was the Abbott Labs sensor. So they weren't actually using their own sensor. They're using an FDA approved sensor, um, which was FDA approved, but it just how they could leverage it was, was not effectively. So um, you were buying a off the shelf Abbott Labs sensor. It's as simple as that. You weren't buying something brand as Super Sapiens. You were buying these sensors from them. And here in Europe, that wasn't a problem, but you couldn't do that in the US. And they never got the US piece off the ground. With that all backstory, we get to their announcement this past week, um, which is that they have ceased operations, uh, essentially. And so they're going to basically wind things down over the next, I guess, what, 60 days, I think it was, 45 days? Something like that. It was a confusing letter that went out in terms of, like, <laughs> <laughs> like you know. <laughs> confusing would be the other statement. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, one part of the letter said strategic restructuring, and then the other part of the letter said result of this closure. So I think, you know, the writing's on the wall, but basically at this point they have ceased shipping sensors. All memberships have been terminated. The app will continue functioning for the foreseeable future, but you'll be able to see historical data for a while. There's not going to be customer support, so on and so forth. So basically I think, you know, again, the writing's on the wall, but so there's so many factors that kind of went into this. I think the fact that they were only available in the EU, the pricing, and really what's the feasibility in terms of the audience for this particular product. So it is, I think it's a very good product in concept in terms of for the endurance athlete, making sure that they don't bonk. But was this really targeted for everyone out there that was doing these types of activities or was it just more targeted for or more useful i guess you could say for people with diabetic issues you know it, i think it's too soon to tell i i don't i don't want to say they were too early right i think that that might not be incorrect um i think they i'm not sure if the science yet supports really using this for endurance sports purposes right i think there are hints that that it could but I think there's also a lot of hints that like me as a, a human that it doesn't work, right? And that's how do you mitigate that? And maybe it's simply they need more data to look at someone like me and go, oh, so for you, here's how you train with this instead. Another factor that really hurt them was the UCI banned their use. Um, so uh, they had a full sponsorship of one of the pro teams uh, back a couple years ago and like race one of the season. Um, the UCI came along and said, nope continuous glucose monitors, unless there's a medical reason, are not permitted. Um, and that really hurt them from a, and they were sponsoring a World Tour team, right? That's a, a big deal. Um, and to not have their athletes use it, uh, not be able to showcase that really hurt them. And, you know, it's one thing to showcase a bunch of triathletes doing it, 
but uh, you can make a lot more, you know, marketing bang by showcasing, you know, a a world tour team in the Tour de France, and they couldn't do that. Um, So I, it'll be interesting to see, you know, there's obviously tons of talk about, you know, when will we finally have non-invasive continuous glucose monitoring? And when people say non-invasive, they mean there's no needle, right? And I think, you know, a needle is something that while the needle nine out of 10 times never hurt when you injected it, it was the sound of this crazy contraption that like <laughs> you'd inject it. And it was like, Ka-kum. it literally <laughs> sounded like a, yeah, it was yeah. A, it like, sounded like someone being shot next to you, right? Like it was super loud. The needle itself didn't hurt nine out of 10 times, but like, one out of 10 times, like you'd be like, oh, there's like a weird burning sensation there for an hour and you just hit the wrong part. I don't know, like it wasn't ideal, but there's a reality to that does scare off a lot of people. Like there's no, again, it doesn't scare off me. And But like my wife, the first time she's like, ah, it took her a while to like, to give it a whirl. Um, and then eventually the curiosity of what it could bring, you know, got her over that edge. But uh, she just, she too didn't really see the value in it um, in trying it for a, a month or so. Uh, but I think if you can get to non-invasive accuracy, like, so if you can get something that is non-invasive and accurate, then I think you can start to collect the data on you know, potentially tens of thousands of people, um, you know, millions of people and start to develop and go, oh, here is the training scenario it works for and here's the training scenario it doesn't work for. Yeah. But getting to that non-invasiveness, I mean, it's like the the thing that every Apple um, media site likes to, um, you know, have a headline news at least like four times a year, you know, next version of Apple Watch will have, you know, non-invasive continuous glucose monitoring. That is so far away. Yeah, it's it yeah. so, so, so far away. Um, it's not even close to being the point where you can have rumors on it. Um, despite all these companies like to pretend it is, it's not. Well, I mean, considering even with this product that is invasive, that it's still not necessarily, not even 90% correct for the entire population. So, um, and it's kind of a bummer. It's kind of a bummer that it wasn't working correctly for you because uh, so, you know, we've done a lot of long yep. rides together and this is just like a little bit of inside baseball, as Ray would say. <laughs> but like when, when when Ray bonks, he bonks really hard. <laughs> <laughs> so for this type of product, for this to work for you, this would be incredible, you know, just because, you know, you could actually yep. monitor those levels. Um what is super interesting, though, is that, you know, Ray then does refuel quite well. And then he has this like. I don't know, this is like six hour surge sort of thing where he just like, I'm back, baby. <laughs> you, just go, yeah. you just go absolutely nuts. Um, I always wanted to actually try one of these products myself too. So I'm not sure if many people know. So I'm more of one of those like intermittent fasting, one meal a day type of people. So when we go on our rides, I usually don't eat anything for like three, four hours. And I do fine, but I think my body's just used to that, uh, using fats as uh, a fuel source. Yep. So I really am fascinated by this type of technology just because I kind of want to see what my body's doing. So yeah, I guess whenever technology does get good enough where it could be uh, useful for you and to show what my body's doing, um, we would love to test that. So that'd be cool. Yeah. All right. So next up, quick little topic that we can talk about. So Google released some updates to the original Pixel Watch. So basically these are features that were available on the Pixel Watch 2, but they finally have updated the original Pixel Watch with an auto workout mode where it can detect your activities for running, walking, elliptical, spinning, outdoor cycling, treadmill and rowing, and just like automatically start that on your watch. There's going to be pace training where you can set up different pace zones and stuff like that, as well as heart rate zone training. So again, these are all features that were already available on the Pixel Watch 2 that came to the original original Pixel Watch. But yep. so, you know, talking about Google versus something like Apple, this seems like this seems like it took a while to get backported to the original Pixel Watch. What are your thoughts on that? I'm- I'm surprised too as well because like back in you know October or whatever it was they announced these like there's other things that was coming to the Pixel Watch Gen 1 that came really quickly it came within like two weeks and in that case it was funny because even at the launch for the Pixel Watch 2 they were very hesitant to talk about the time frames for those newly announced things to hit a Gen 1 Pixel Watch like yeah. they, didn't, they didn't want to talk about it at all despite the fact that it showed up literally like 10 days later right and it was like why didn't you talk about it then because you you clearly were ready for it so I'm not clear on why this took so long. I don't know if like something else 
came up during development. And maybe that's why they were so hesitant to talk about what things would come right away versus eventually, um, because those things came right away. And then this took, you know, what, four months now, I guess, five months, something. Yeah. Um, a long time. So I don't, I don't understand that. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see, you know, if we look, compare how Apple and how Google have handled updates from a, a fitness standpoint, but even just watch things in general, right? I mean, generally speaking, so Apple, you know, has their new version of watchOS that hits production every September right now, anyways, um, in, you know, concurrently with the newest launch of whatever the newest Apple Watch is that year, every year, right? And they announced that new watchOS version in June at WWDC every year. And then over the summer, developers get to validate it and consumers as well get to test those new features. And then, you know, by the time you hit September, they're now in production. And maybe Apple throws a couple other features in there with the new watches as well. And then into the fall, Apple usually has has basically two kind of core updates, if you will. One that kind of floats in the roughly October-ish, early November time frame with some things that maybe didn't make it for launch. And then one that tries to hit just before Christmas in December with a few more things. We've seen Apple roll out track mode, for example, in the past and other, other fitnessy things that happened during that time frame. Um, but then once you get beyond, you know, January, there's really not much new from a watch OS standpoint until you get to the June betas again for um, you know WWC and the announcement of the new watch OS version. Sometimes there's like some updates that may be like countrywide. So for example, we saw that with last year track mode coming to more countries, et cetera. But we see kind of Apple pretty much like like a submarine. They run silent, run deep until you get to they surface again in June. Um, versus Google tends to kind of do these smaller drops throughout the year. You know, Apple's big drop is like, boom, we are here, baby, um, you know, each each summer. But Google is kind of like, drop, drop, drop every like three-ish or so months, give or take. So two different strategies. Um, it'll be interesting to see if we'll see another Google drop this spring that is also for the Pixel Watch 2, because this is really focused on Pixel Watch One, um, minus the the public transit directions on Wear OS being non a non fitness thing. Mm -hmm. Google has always fascinated me because they obviously have a huge portfolio and you know a, a gigantic company. I mean, Apple's a gigantic company as well, but Apple just seems a lot more organized than Google is. Where Google, they seem like they're kind of all over the map and. You know, with larger companies, things take longer to happen just because of just yep. more hoops to, to run through. But Google is just like that one company where I'm just like, wow, it takes you guys like not just longer, but quite a bit longer for many things to happen. So I'm surprised that we haven't seen them really double down. I guess when I, I said back in when the Pixel Watch 2 came out, right, it was a very modest, it was a minor minor everything yeah um and i'm surprised because i think like the writing has been on the wall when apple especially but there are other competitors samsung too right within the within the android um you know the Wear OS realm samsung has really doubled down on fitness features over the last uh year and a half two years and i'm i'm really surprised i thought we would see google be like oh they're doing it and oh apple and we're seeing you know kickups from garmin and others like fitness side I, I thought we would see that the wear os side would really like pick up especially given they acquired fitbit right of all of all things and we just haven't seen that like the kick and i wonder if some of that was due to a lot of integration efforts behind the scenes um in getting google and fitbit teams like to become one ish team right i think we talked about this at some point in the past where uh, those two teams were not bffs right for a long time uh, and a lot of animosity between those two teams um both at the lower levels and the upper levels and i think we're finally seeing them act as vaguely one team as of this past fall we saw that with a ton of new features and maybe this year we'll see them like start to drive fitness features forward that that makes sense. I think this year, I would almost call it a make or break year for Google, really. Totally. Uh, yeah. 100%. Uh, yeah. They really need to, first of all, you know, come out with a larger version of the Pixel Watch. And I think just come out with a more congruent story with the Pixel Watch versus Fitbit and how that all works together. So, yeah. So I'm super yep. eager to see what happens this fall or possibly yeah. early, earlier. Yeah. And uh, yep, last exactly. thing. 
let's talk about Sunto for a little bit. So a couple interesting bits of Sunto news that came out. So first of all, uh, they partnered with Xiaomi. I apologize if, if I'm not saying that correctly. So their Mi Fitness users can actually utilize the Sunto app. There's basically some integration between the two there. And there's also the Sunto UTMB partnership. So did you dive into the uh, the Mi Fitness Sunto integration? I haven't, I haven't actually yeah. reviewed a Xiaomi device in quite some time. So yeah, I, I can't really speak to this that well right now. So it's pretty interesting. So what they've done is Sunto and Xiaomi, Xiaomi um, have partnered such that you can, if you have a Xiaomi watch and you go ahead and you link it to a Sunto account using the Sunto app, you can then use the Sunto app as your main app effectively for looking at fitness focused data from those watches, any of the watches that pull through. So think of, in this case, Sunto becoming the Strava to Xiaomi, right? So in other words, you can open up the Sunto app and you can see your workouts, you can see your trended stuff and all that kind of fun stuff is now there. Um, and it's really the first time we've seen Sunto or uh, even Polar or Garmin or anyone else for that matter, um, like OEM out their app for fitness watch purposes. The closest we've seen to that is Polar with the Sennheiser um, earbuds and like having integration there, but that's not quite to the same level as this. Like yeah. this is, the next level up. And I think it makes a lot of sense. It allows them to, to tap into that market and bring brand awareness um, without really cutting into their sales, realistically speaking, right? Like those, I think, are not necessarily the same uh, groups of consumers that are buying those watches. So that's super interesting, just as like the an industry churning point, if you will. Like it's one of those like, huh, that's, I wonder who else might do that, right? And we've yeah. seen Polar certainly um, OEM or, you know, license out their algorithms. Right? Yeah. So that's something exactly. that we've seen over the last little while, um, but not necessarily the platform, like the actual app itself, right? The Flow app. Um, yeah. And so I, I wouldn't put it past Polar to start licensing out the Flow app as well. I think that would, we saw that again with the headphones. I think it makes sense for other other entities as well. Um, but then we get to the next bit, um, which is, actually, we'll just do like a quick in-between one, which is that Sunto announced two new more apps um so vertical and uh, uh race walk so basically focused on like more apps that they build into their watch and stuff like that which is cool but i'd still like to see that be just native features in the watch to be honest and not taking up app slots um but the last piece is actually probably the more like huh uh news bit which is that sunto has uh their utmb sponsorship um now so the lead sponsor for utmb and that's interesting for so many reasons, oh, gosh. right? Be yeah. <laughs> um, so it's interesting because this is like the revolving door of UTMB sponsorships. So most recently, prior to now, it was Wahoo uh, with the Wahoo Rival Watch that was the, the UTMB sponsor. But of course, Wahoo uh, announced back in December that they're effectively exiting the watch business. There there will not be a rival V2. They've they made it very clear about that. Um, and, you know, they're going to go in some different direction that doesn't involve them making watches. So it didn't make sense to have the giant Wahoo rival um, watch, you know, thing above the finish line uh, as the finish line banner at UTMB when you when you use it. Well, it's a, yeah, it's a, the rival is a triathlon watch and UTMB is yeah. trail running. And a, yeah, so... There's that. Yeah, there's that. There's that. Uh, yeah, it, 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 it probably didn't make sense to begin with, but uh, it, you know, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's there now. Um, or was there anyways. But the real kicker here, by the way, when you go back and like history, is that I was doing some digging on this. Um, so like, you know what? I remember when Garmin launched their one of the Phoenixes, they did it at UTMB. And I went back to my notes and dug around. And yeah, when they launched the Phoenix 6 in 2019, yeah. they did so at UTMB. And while they did not have a giant phoenix over the, the starting line then, um, they did act, they were actually listed as the official supplier um, for UTMB that year. So this is like the bit of a circle, full circle thing. And when I would go to UTMB, not to run it, but to I just happened to like go every year. It was the same week as Eurobike. And so I would drive through from, from Paris to um, Eurobike, which is in uh, Germany. I would drive uh, with the big RV and it go past Sean each year and just happened to go like through and TMB that weekend and some years I would sit there and I would just would count watches like I would look at watches on people's wrists as they were coming in the final area towards the finish line and Sunto used to dominate this like this used to be like you would you would take a lot to find a Garmin watch on someone's wrist and then 
since really you know the phoenix 5-ish into the phoenix 6 and so on that that tide has churned massively um towards being dominated by garmin with a little bit of chorus in there as well yeah um and suunto's suunto's lost a lot of that um despite sponsoring some big neat big name athletes and in yeah. fact chorus picked up one of suunto's big name athletes as well yep mm-hmm. um and i and so it'll be interesting to see if this uh, obviously this isn't going to like turn the tide overnight but if if Sunto can you know can find a way to make this also drive sales, and I think Sunto now to be clear, Sunto actually has products in place that are again competitive in this marketplace. Versus yeah. for a few years there, there was just it was just a it was no viable reason why you would choose some of Sunto's offerings versus Garmin or even Coros. But yeah. I think they're finally like turning that that tide. There's a, a, even a couple more interesting topics around this whole partnership. So I guess going off of what you were just talking about in terms of uh, Sunto's positioning right now, again, you know, for all my friends that do a lot of the more ultra running and, you know, more of the trail running community, it's it's basically Garmin and Chorus at this point. You know, Sunto, their name recognition absolutely is better since the vertical and the race for sure. Yep. And those are extremely Definitely. important watches. So that's where yep. having this partnership now with UTMB, that's in my mind, I think it's a smart move for them to get that awareness out there again. You know, this UTMB, it's not, we're, we're not talking about UTMB, the actual race in Chamonix Mont Blanc. We're talking about UTMB as a global organization now. And yeah. so the, the other part of it is that UTMB hasn't been getting amazing press lately either because of their no. Whistler, uh, their handling of the Whistler race. So basically there was the Whistler Alpine Meadows race, a Gary Robbins event. And basically there's a bunch of drama surrounding this entire thing where, you know, the Whistler Alpine Meadows race that went on for years and years on the same weekend. And then Gary Robbins at some point basically stopped getting communication from the Whistler organization slash UTMB. So basically what eventually happened was that UTMB just kind of surprisingly announced the race on the exact same weekend that the uh, Wham race was supposed to happen without any notice. So that uh, created quite a bit of drama in the ultra running community because the Lewis Little Alpine Meadows race was just kind of more, I don't want to say a grassroots event, but, you know, you know, a more homegrown event. And it was kind of basically squashed a bit by the commercialization of UTMB. So that's kind of the other side of this coin where UTMB is not necessarily getting fantastic press either. <laughs> so uh, No, they're, yeah. they're not. And so this is, yeah, it's, I, I don't know if like, soon to worries as much about that i think there's also reality too to like i think a lot of the stuff that's gone on with whistler and the the drama there is very canadian u.s trail running focused sure right Mm -hmm. and i think a lot of the european side looks at that and is like "Uh, anyways going on to something else right and it's like they they know that noise is there but they haven't like it hasn't seeped in, I think, as deeply as it has on the U.S. side. Yeah. Um, and Sunto, being a European company, is certainly aware of that, I'm sure. But I'm not sure if they worry about it as much. Um, and I, I wonder, too, like, is there a goal for this to increase brand awareness of Sunto uh, globally? Or is it more on the European side? Because this is, of course, all their events, like you said. So it's across different different races and things like that. But uh yeah, it's interesting. It was just there's so many little interesting facets to this. Uh, my only thing here, look, at the end of the day, I really hope to see a giant Sunto watch above the finish line, just like the Wahoo watch. Like they need uh, to yeah. continue that same tradition. <laughs> and the cool part is like in the case of the Wahoo watch, if you look at the finish uh, picture there, um, you know, they have like just a they're using basically that as a finisher time. The watch itself shows the finishing time at the top there, but just like a normal calculator style time, right? Like nothing fancy. But if Sunto were to use a Sunto race, the world's their oyster there, right? Because they've got a whole AMOLED style display. So they can do anything within that little like <laughs> finisher thing, graphic wise, right? And yeah. There's also things they could do there. So I'm just asking Sunto one thing. I want to see a watch over the top of the finish line. You heard it there. <laughs> you heard yep. it there. All right. So that's going to do it for this episode of the FitFile podcast. So the next episode, we have been lining up a whole bunch of questions from the internets and we've kind of put together 
I, I don't know. I, I won't give away the actual name of the next episode. No, no, quite. Yeah, exactly. Um, but uh, it's it's going to be a little bit more of a behind the scenes uh, look at what we do as sports tech reviewers. And uh, again, I think a lot of these were prompted by questions that we received on our social channels. So I think the next episode, it's not necessarily going to be focused around one product or anything like that or any news, but I think it's going to be a very interesting episode. It's going to be fun. We're going to have some fun here. Yeah. Um, hope we won't get too much trouble, but we're going to have some fun. So. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, if you do have any interesting topics or questions that you'd like to get featured on the podcast, go ahead and check us out on our Twitters or X, uh, Instagram, what else? Threads. You can you can leave it on the YouTube video. Oh, well, that's right. Yeah. Episode. Mm-hmm. Like we've got a gigantic list here. I'm just scrolling through all the things that people have ideas that we've been like bucketizing into different uh, potential episodes down the road. Yeah. Um, speaking of that, YouTube that is one of many places to uh, see or listen to the podcast. Uh, so we are on Spotify. We're on Apple Podcasts. Uh, you can also go to the direct audio feed uh, at dcrainmaker.com/podcast if you want to use some other sort of audio uh, listener. And then most importantly, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, the fit file on YouTube and that's cool there is that you're both on YouTube music or we're both on YouTube music as well as the video side and you can go back and forth between uh, the audio and the video side if you're just you know have it off the side listening to us and just kind of going back and forth totally yeah cool and yeah if you uh, appreciate uh, what we do or if you like the content that we do please leave us a review on any of those uh, channels and we will see you in the next episode